see you, Leroy. You didn't even clap. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Olama Talks is an initiative that I came up with um, about, I think, a year ago. And the whole thought, like, my thought was this. I was meeting all these amazing thinkers, doers, creators, mostly in anti-racism activism, in feminist activism, in trans activism, in climate justice activism, in disability. I was meeting all these people. And whether it was before demonstration, or after demonstration, or during the organization of the demonstration, I was having these conversations that were blowing my mind. Where I was like, oh my god, I'm actually being educated through a form of sort of knowledge creation and knowledge transfer that perhaps we don't give that much attention to anymore in the sort of Western ac academic hierarchies and whatnot. You so, have to have a thesis for everything. You have to have a thesis and so on. You have to have all kinds of degrees yeah. to be considered authoritative on things. Yeah. So I figured, why don't I figure out a way to record these conversations and also transmit it, show people what happens when people who are earnest and vulnerable when they talk, the kind of amazing things they come up with. So oh, the bullshit they come up with. Also, <laughs> oh, also, oh, damn it, you know my whole language. <laughs> I take this very personal. That's feedback from the from the listeners. No, but um, so that's how it started, and since then we've made. Actually, I think we've actually made at least one a month. And the community of activists and thinkers that I've met have been so generous in coming to speak with us and just sharing what they think, you know, in front of a camera and sometimes in front of live audiences. So I want to thank you already before we get started for the courage and the effort and the time. To and let's come see here. if there's still gratitude at the end, but okay. Okay, let's <laughs> see. Also, this is a very short format for me. Normally we do it in like an hour long. And we only have 30 minutes. So what I want to ask you, though, is we're doing this 30 minutes, but please promise me that you will come back for another like pro proper longer. <laughs> please. If I say it on camera, I have to do it. <laughs> so, there's... I promise to think deeply about it. OK. okay so are you, are you testing? Are you saying that if this works out well, you might? OK. Here, people, let's make this work. OK. The reason why I was so enthusiastic and so happy when they said, do you want to do it on that talk with happiness? I was like, yes, please. It's because I've actually met you. I think the first time I met you were at, I was re re like rioting at the, at the Reclaim. Uh, uh, Reclaim Our Pride. Yes. yes. And I was standing, at, do you, does anybody, do you all know Reclaim Our Pride mm -hmm. as a project? As a, well, it's a community of queer people who are not very happy with the way that Pride has become very commercialized very sort of like an opportunity for companies who for 364 days of the year don't care about us, all of a sudden they can make themselves look really good by showing up and by spending a lot of money. And so we, we staged a kind of like counter event and you showed up yeah. and you started talking to me yeah, and I'm standing there and you start talking about decolonization and about intersectionality and about pinkwashing and so who is this? This is my new best friend. <laughs> No, I do remember when we met and the conversation on the we were standing on the bridge and you said you're from Burundi and I was like, oh my god. So for folks, um, I hold a Kenyan passport, but I name myself as African. Mm. So whenever I meet another African yeah, when you start in Europe, I'm like, oh my people, my people, I see you. <laughs> so that excited me. And then yes, we talked a lot about yeah. just how the world is fucked up, but at the same time, how we have amazing thinkers and folks doing radical yeah. work. I just remember that you did tell me at that time that you were a Pan-Africanist. Yeah. And the, I just, this wasn't the question I was going to ask first, but <laughs> who does that anymore? Who does what? Who identifies as Pan-African? It seems to have sort of, it's died down it does, in it the murky waters of neoliberal post-colonial <laughs> rationale. But that's because we're buying into the idea that the borders matter. Right? Yeah. So they decided in 1884 in Germany, this is Kenya, that's Uganda, that's Burundi. Mm -hmm. Like, that's deep bullshit. We're yeah. all African. And our struggles, whether we're in Europe, whether we're in yeah. the US, whether we're in China, we're in Africa, we're black people, we're all black people. Yeah. So I actually met a friend of mine who was the first person who identified themselves to me as Pan-African. And I was like, what the fuck? And then in conversation, I was like, oh, this makes sense. And I have a word to describe what makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, and I am deliberate to name myself as Pan-African because in this day and age, it's mostly one, it's mostly men, yeah. and then two, it's mostly folks from the older generation who name themselves as Pan-African. But we've lost, I think, a very important arsenal, in, no, a very important tool in our watches, right? 
by, by being Pan-African, by identifying ourselves across oceans as black people fighting one struggle, we've lost something. So it's important for us to reclaim it and to, to know that all these are our struggles if we actually want to get out yeah. of, oh, this makes me sad. You know, it really makes me sad when I think of how, how, how black people buy into it. Right? Yeah. We've bought into the idea that we are fundamentally different people. And yeah. it's, the, it's that's what white supremacy does. I say to a lot of people, I've understood, for example, um, black Europeans for black people in Europe via white supremacy. I've mm -hmm. understood black people in the US via white supremacy because of what TV tells me, mm -hmm. because of what the newspapers tell me. And very few times do we sit in conversation with each other as black people talking about the microcosms of our lives yeah. and those points of connection. Yeah. And that's fundamentally what Pan-Africanism is to me. That's, yeah. the, that's what we need to get back to. We need to have conversations yeah. with each other. I think, I think, in all fairness, I think that there are some, some level of, 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 because right now I see more and more young black people talk about the need for safer spaces and the need for like sort of creating spaces where we can have conversations with one another about our realities and I think there are some interesting projects, mostly women-led obviously, like um, Cecile Meke who started a kind of pan-European um, like YouTube series of talking to like black Africans and, and like African diaspora living in Europe and giving them the time and the stage to really talk about the specificity of their yeah. situation and their realities. But what is interesting is if you watch, because it's called strolling, huh? so you just watch somebody just walking around in their city, in their European city as a black person, and sharing about things like racism and things like um, uh, uh, you know, institutionalized, you know, oppression and about politics, about queerness, and you know, many different things go about. And but what is interesting is you look at these different people from across the continent, and some of them are speaking Italian, others are speaking French, others are speaking Dutch, and and they have a there's a certain commonality of the gay, so sort of like how we relate to whiteness and to white supremacy and to Europe being in Europe, right? And that was really cool. And then I was thinking when I saw that about like sort of how we create these spaces. I wonder whether or not in the in the sort of like sometimes I wonder that we lose sight of what it's for because I'm not really sure for me. And maybe as a as an activist um, who has been around the world, seen women create things for their own, and maybe you can inform me on that. But sometimes I I think maybe it's not enough to think of safe spaces as an end to themselves as a as but I tend to think of it as a means. Mm -hmm. A means to what though? To what? I, I don't, I guess, because what happens when people come together and talk, like truly talk, and, and can be vulnerable, and, and can sort of arise from the superficiality mm -hmm. of sort of like only talking about what white people think about us, right? Yeah. If, we, if they're not around, and we yeah. can actually, like you said, like really get into like, being from Burundi means this, mm -hmm. and being queer and Burundian means that, and so on. And to just sort of compare, I think what you end up developing are strategies towards the world yeah. outside, because the world is still unsafe. Yeah. And but we cannot, especially in the European context, we cannot dream up of a ways of just moving from safe space to safe space to safe space. Like there must be an a, like a, a, a an orientation, a, a sort of. That something must come out of it that makes us more able to deal with this. But maybe, I hear that. I think of them maybe both as an end in themselves, but also as a means to an end. Mm. So an end in themselves, I, I find one of the most powerful things about being in space with, I don't necessarily call them safe space, because I think there's still, there's still a lot of pain that happens in those spaces, and a lot of healing that could happen, not necessarily, but could. Um, but I think one of the most powerful things for me being in such space is being witnessed. Mm -hmm. um, because I was actually thinking about this as I was coming into Rotterdam. So I've been here maybe three or four times since the X number of years I've lived in the Netherlands. And one of that is a shame because I know you spent is. way too much time in Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> because one of the things I appreciate about Rotterdam is I see a lot more folks of color. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually feel seen mm -hmm. in a way that when I'm moving through most of my day to day in Amsterdam, I don't feel seen. Mm. But so when I come into these safer spaces, I feel I, my experience, my life as happy, not not happy the black person, or not happy the queer woman, or mm. just happy in 
with no tags yeah. gets witnessed. Yeah. And they get an opportunity to also witness other people yeah. who just are because, and that's it. And what does that do? I feel all nice inside. Right? right? Stronger, yeah. right? I feel like I can take on the world tomorrow. Or, yeah. or I, I cried today in this space and that allows me to wake up tomorrow just a little, yeah. a little less bad, right? Yeah. And that matters. Yeah. But at the same time, as a means to an end, I agree with you. I think that's the place where just by being in communion and community with each other, we'll come up with strategies. Right. We'll come up with ideas. We'll figure out what is the thing that we want to do so that this moment can be every moment, yeah. right? Yeah. And then we go out and do ridiculous things. And <laughs> Some and they look at you go like, how come you're so brave? Yeah. Because I got a bunch of people I spoke to and they told me, go do it. And when you do it, we're going to be here to receive exactly, you. Right? Right? Yeah. You've got your back. Yeah. And that matters. So yeah. I think they're both things and they matter. But yeah, like when you're talking about strolling, the first time I watched a couple of them, for me, it was like... I was crying. I cried, actually. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's like we're witnessing blackness in its multiplicity. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's beautiful. That in and of itself is beautiful. Look, you move around yeah. in sort of the funding and donor world, right? So, um, did, does everybody know what uh, Happy does for a living? No? I Happy gives people, people money. <laughs> <laughs> and with people, we mean specifically women, right? Girls, girls, folk, yes. Uh, we like people who give money. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome. <laughs> Can we give her a round of applause for giving women money? <laughs> You also gave me money, yes. so I should probably <laughs> disclose that. Uh, but then again, like Trump doesn't even give away his taxes, so why should I have no, gone? <laughs> this, this, this is the closest we can get this to reparations. Okay, so okay. we're taking okay, money. Yes. That's what we do. But you move in the world of giving money, and that world, as far as I can tell, as far as I've known it from a Burundian context, mm -hmm. it is a world that is very much dominated with sort of like this sort of European way of like, like, okay, we're gonna go help these people, we're gonna fix their situation, and we know better, we know best how to do that, yep. and we're gonna train them to spend the money that we're giving them, mm -hmm. and there's this sort of, there's this sort of like top-down approach, very like, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, as you're talking about sort of like, like, being moved by people who are recognized and who recognize each other and who get to tell their story and the complexity comes about. That sounds like quite the opposite <laughs> of what a no, like what I founder wants. Like, okay, so what am I gonna like what do these people need? And I don't even need to know exactly what they are going through. I just need to tell them what they need, right? Yeah. So how do you So I'm on air and I'm speaking in the voice of Mama Cash. Are you? No, the what, way, wait. From the way I say this, um, this is my disclaimer, but it's not really a disclaimer. I've said this in the office. So I name myself as a professional money launderer. That's what I do. <laughs> okay, now we're talking. And the reason I say that is the kind of money that Mama Cash gives allows folks to do these kinds of things we're talking about, right? Um, folks can sit down together and have an idea. And that idea works for 30 days, and then they're like, oh shit, this idea doesn't work anymore. Let's figure out a new idea. And then they think about something that works for six months. Mm -hmm. And then, right? Because that's how most of our, our, our organizing work looks like, right? We do wow. something, yeah, exactly. yeah. it works out, something else changes, right? So we want to fund people to do that. Wow. We want to fund people to be able to make make sense in their, in their life mm -hmm. in that moment. Yeah. So, hence the money laundering. So we get money that comes to us that looks like, you know, we want our log frames, we want you to tell us what you're gonna do, your strategic fund, blah, blah, blah. And we take it, we absorb it, mm -hmm. and we're able to then send it out in ways that then folks can actually do the work yeah. where they're at, how they need to do it. Yeah. So there's a lot of, there's a lot that then we have to do in the office. For example, sometimes we say no to some money. So some people will oh, give really? the cash to mama cash, like we can't take your money because it would change how we work. And because how they come with with, with they extremes. come with their demands, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So we'll have one of the biggest things we have to fight is audits. Mm -hmm. So we're fine, come audit on the cash. Mm -hmm. But then not all of our partners are yeah. able to be audited in you know the European yeah. uh, what are they called? PMC. Do you know what those people called? The bankers. Accountants. Accountants in them, right? Yeah, yeah. The way they want it doesn't work for yeah. everybody. 
So mm -hmm. we have to find ways. We have our ways of um, being holding our partners accountable. Mm -hmm. we, like, it doesn't mean you get money and you run off and things are good. No, we still have to be in conversation. But it doesn't always fit the model of what capitalist white supremacy wants. Yeah. So that's the money laundering part. Yeah. So sometimes they're like, no, we won't take your money. Or if we do take your money, you have to work with us in ways that allows uh, the funding we give out to be flexible yeah. um, for folks to be able to pay their salaries, right? yeah. to pay rent, yeah. so that it's not purely you're running projects, you're building dams, you're digging toilets, but you're never getting paid to do that. But you're never tempted to kind of like sort of direct me? Organization. But how can I? I mean, Based for example, what? Let, 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 let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. For example, um, the inclusion of, say, like trans people mm -hmm. in women's spaces is a big of a, it's a big of an issue, right? And I think it's not just an issue here in Europe, it's an issue around the world, mm -hmm. right? And is it something that Mama Cash like can sort of like put on partners or people they want to give money? It's like, okay, if you're going to get money from us, we're going to expect you to be inclusive towards trans women. Like if, mm -hmm. like if you, when we mean women, we mean all the women. Yeah. Right? Is that something which you can do, which you, which you do, so feel comfortable let, with? Let me say it this way. So our work is also political. Right? There's a lot of donors who don't call their work political. We deliberately name our work political. There's positions we've taken. So one of the, so we, for example, are very deliberate in that we will not support folks who are trans antagonistic. Okay. That doesn't mean that everybody has to be have trans people in their groups. But if you if you would exclude trans people because they are trans, then you're in conflict with the politics okay. that we yeah. would support, right? And then we have a conversation. Money's complicated, capitalism has fucked with us, so unfortunately, sometimes folks will just say this to us because they are our donors. Yeah. But there's also folks with whom we've had conversations and we give I think politics is aspirational, right? So it's, we, we're all on a journey of learning. So we'll walk with groups. Like I remember a group um, <clears throat> that after we'd been funding them for a couple of years, we learned that their position around sex work was um, they were anti-sex work. Mm, yeah. And so... That was going to be my <laughs> Okay, we talked about trying to help us. So then we had a conversation with them, but it's just that they had never... They had only had one side of the argument around yeah. sex work. That sex work was, you know, the typical one of them not choosing, they're being forced into it, etc., yeah, yeah, etc. Yeah, yeah. And then we introduced them actually to sex work activists. Okay. And then they had, so we're not the ones having the conversation. Like here, are sex work activists who do this kind of political education, be in conversation with them. And it didn't take two months. It took a couple of years, and the group got to the point where now they're supportive of sex worker rights. Look, I heard about. I heard. I was talking to also a large funder. Uh, who spends a lot of his money in East Africa, and they told me that they introduced a new program whereby they would um, sort of like to the to the women group that they're giving money to would say you have to work with at least one other uh, disenfranchised, marginalized group. So like oh, and you can choose between women with disabilities, or trans uh, 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 women, or sex workers, you know, or all of them. But at least you gotta choose one of them, or else we will not give you money. Right? This kind of like top-down approach again, right? And I remember I heard that and I was like, hmm, what would Abby think about that? <laughs> well, do you think that that could be successful? That kind of strategy of funding where you'd be like, okay, this is, you got, you got to be intersectional. I don't want to say no. Okay. Because because there's two there's too many spaces, too many moments when folks who are on the margins keep being pushed into the margins. Mm -hmm. The only challenge with that model is that I don't think it works. Okay. Right? Um, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago that was talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And we kept getting us. So from the way Mama Cash works is we fund what we call self-led organizing because self-determination is key. So whatever community of folks who have been marginalized by, by a broader society you are, you decide to organize, we support you. Mm -hmm. and, we, and then we walk with you in your journey. If we will share our opinions, our political opinions, if they're in conflict, and we'd love also to hear from our groups. We learn a lot from our partners. Um, it, it truly is about conversation. I think through that, okay, so, yeah. 
So that this diversity, equity, inclusion <coughs> workshop. And so when we talked about our model, this was one of the questions we got asked a lot. Like, what do you do if you're funding a group and people ask you, and what, and you know that the group doesn't support, uh, doesn't have trans people in their leadership or something or something? Would you force it on them? Because often the model for diversity, equity, and inclusion for funders is you get a list and you're told 25% of your leadership needs to be yeah. diverse, yeah. And which means non-white male, right? Um, I mean, that should be already you know, right. <laughs> 25 percent Something like that. Like, they'll have numbers. And I was like, we can give you the numbers, right? Okay. Like, I think yeah, that's, yeah. right, a group, if we, if you want to get X amount of money, you'll hire five five women. Right? Yeah. And you're, and then you're 20 people, you have five women, you're like, you're good. But your five women will be the cleaner, will be the woman at the front, at the reception yeah. desk, yeah. right? None of the people in the organization have yeah. any decision-making power. Yeah. But you've checked a box. Yeah. Like, I don't think that model works. No, I don't no. think it works if you impose it that way. But I do want also to say no to it because folks are still getting some resources. Yeah. So. It's, I, I mean, the person who told me this was very optimistic about the new program. And it was like, no, it's working. And I was talking about how, like, oh, they, 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 you know, they're learning from each other, type of thing. But I don't know. I was just a little bit, when I heard it, I was like, okay, I'm supposed to be very. I think that this person also told it to me because I'm trans. I was like, Oh yeah, only you ten minutes. Thing we're doing. This is not possible. Only ten minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> I just got started. Haven't asked any serious questions. Haven't asked any serious questions. <laughs> <I'm even laughs> serious serious questions. <laughs> but I remember them saying that, and I, I think that they were saying it because I'm trying to go. And I was, I think I was supposed to be like, oh, great work you're doing in Uganda, in Kenya, or Uganda. And but a part of me was like, I don't know. I, I mean, if I was a trans group in Kenya and Uganda being told this, I don't know if I'd want to go into it. If I had other resources, yeah. that's the only catch, right? Yeah. Because the only reason I'd be in conversation with those people is because the donor has said it. It's not because the organization inherently exactly. has a political exactly. um, will to yeah. change them. Nothing, right? So I also just think about how that works. You're an organization, a small, ta small time organization somewhere in a, a region. Uh, in Uganda, and you've got pressing needs, and you've you know you sat with other women, thought about them, planned around it because it's a lot of work to get, and then they go like, yeah, no, you gotta find one extra group. Mm -hmm. So okay, so how are you gonna do? You're gonna go and just scout down the streets. Mm -hmm. it, it, I, I don't know. know. <laughs> like, and a lot of times then they turn to their donors and their donors will say work with these groups. With these groups. We but then them. these groups sit together and be like, okay, so I want my money to do the thing I need to do. Mm -hmm. You want the money to do the thing you want to do. So how about we just sign? Yeah, and then when the donor comes for their visit, we we'll, smile we'll and come wait. together, yeah. right? But, <laughs> exactly. anyways, but that was me going like, I, I feel this is still very top down, mm -hmm. very much telling people what they should do. Well, I think that there are ways in which perhaps that women around the world, especially I think in the Burundian context, that they work together, like across class boundaries, across um, even you know gender boundaries that perhaps are not that visible to the, mm -hmm. to the founder, to the donor. There might be ways in which that are not institutionalized, that, are, that you don't really know thing. about. I think a lot of, so like when I was much younger, back in the day when I lived in Kenya for a moment, we did organizing, um, and that was one of the first moments we were organizing across class, across, I think class was a big one, and yeah. across many parts of the continent, class is a huge thing. Um, but it wasn't formal organizing, right? Yeah. So as soon as the organizations, right, you have your professional labels, you have your directors and your executives and all of that, then those are the places I find that you need the, yeah. it becomes very artificial across yeah. Um, movement organizing yeah. but in lived realities every day I think I think there's more room for that I think that happens more often. Yeah. I don't think it's but I also don't think it's easy because um, because our, our, our notions of injustice are so deeply entrenched yeah. right so like when I think of one of my friends who has struggled trying to find space in the broader women's movement because she's trans, mm -hmm. right? It's it's it has been and continues to be a struggle. Yeah. Like yeah, it's I, real. I, I it's, know. It's, it's real. very real. But that uh, just coming back to um, sort of pan Africanism. Are we running out of time? <laughs> People are moving over. <laughs> um, coming back to pan Africanism and I was just thinking about perhaps you know, as a queer person sort of trying to excavate histories and traditional, perhaps, alliances between queer people, women, women, trans folks, gender non-conforming folks. 
like not having anything to fall back on because it's all destroyed. Mm -hmm. Like at least in the, I know that in Uganda there's still a lot of history around, you know, queer kings and whatnot, and they, mm -hmm. they remember this. Mm -hmm. But in Burundi, it is um, like the Catholic Church is almost like killed it all. Like there's just no very little history left in sort of understanding what the lives were of queer people before colonialism. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether, perhaps like, I, I have, I find myself trying to think that maybe it was all better before colonialism. Mm -hmm. Like maybe, we don't know, but I want to believe that we were not divided along these lines of gender and of sexual orientation and, or even sexual behavior. Mm -hmm. There's no word in Kirun before gay or lesbian, mm -hmm. but I tend to think, I thought about it and I, I think it's more of a strategy of inclusion instead of a, a strategy of erasure. Like, if we don't name it, it's just what everybody does, okay? <laughs> like, it's mm -hmm. And I thought, and I'm like, do you, perhaps as a Pan-Africanist, but also somebody who sees all these movements looking for new mm -hmm. theories and new ways, like, do you see that happening, that people look back to a time before and say, like, it must have been better. <laughs> I think people do look back, yeah. but I don't think it was all sunny and rosy and lovely. Because in Kenya, in a traditional, there, there's a it's traditional like, court that ruled that like, women could get married in traditional. So like my community, among the Kamba people, yeah. um, and this is conversations I have with my folks and I laugh. I have, <laughs> so in, in Kamba community, if the, the story as it is told today, not, I don't know how it was told before um, Christianity rolled in. The story is it's told today, if I as a woman was unable to reproduce and have children, I would then marry another woman, and then uh -huh. that woman's children would be, and okay, so I have a husband, I can't give my husband children, so I go marry a woman. This woman's children are my children, and they're my husband's children. But I am the husband to this woman. Uh -huh. And I provide, we live together, you know, we sleep in the same hut, yeah. Life is okay. together. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever I ask my folks about this, they're like, "But that was only about children." Like, oh, yeah, but you're sure they didn't? Are you sure? Yeah. Like you're there, but no, that's how they were there. Right. Yeah. Um, and there's so, and I have aunts, great aunts on both parents' side who did this. So oh, like, queerness is in my blood, people. So <laughs> I, <do it. laughs> I, okay. I was meant to be. <laughs> I was meant to be. Um, but and I think there's 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 very many attempts across the continent yeah. for people to there's find so these many, narratives, yeah. these examples. Um, there's a book that was written by, by a South African called Queer Boy. No, Wife Husbands. I can't remember. Okay. We'll have to put it in the show notes because this also goes online. Yeah. We'll put, I, will look for the, oh, I will look for the title, okay. Okay. Liberty, which does that, which has ex, ex, um, excavated a lot of history. Yeah. But I think... But, okay, but, because we have no time. There's one more thing I just thought of right now. <laughs> I, thought, I was another thing that I'm hearing a lot is the idea that patriarchy is, is something uh, that uh, well, came with white supremacy. Uh, that came with the Catholic Church. And yes, I think to a certain extent, I listen to sort of the ways that the, 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 the construct of gender of womanhood in Burundi is very different than the construct of womanhood here in Europe. Like there is in the Burundian sort of imagination and, and thinking on women, there's none of that fragility stuff and that like needs protection stuff. It's more like women are conceived that perceived as very dangerous, as sort of like disruptive. The word even umugore mm -hmm. means the disruptor, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And there's a bit of, I've never grown up, the women in my life never were sort of the weaker sex, none of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking maybe, yes, maybe it's, it's, I think I also think he's no. Think? No, I do think it was patriarchy. I think it looked different. I, I think it did look different for sure. Yes. Um, just because of how we constructed gender, how gender was understood, how it moved, it was malleable. I think, I, but I don't know if it was as important, for example, as age. So a lot of yeah. African communities, it's. It's about age, right? The for example, I can talk endlessly about a person without indicating what the gender is, but I have to at some point exactly. make clear whether they're older than me or younger. Even the, the way I address them, the, yeah. what, the very word I use, um, mm -hmm. I think age becomes an important factor, but then it's all the women who play this role in society and all the men who play different roles. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't think it, it looks the same, but I can't imagine just even understanding how... Um, for example, inheritance law has continued to play around, yeah. right? So inheritance law was, yes, there's 
parts that are about white supremacy, but outside white supremacy, there's stuff around just, I just want to make sure that the person who gets the land is my child. Yeah. So the yeah. woman control her movement, etc., etc. Wait a minute, so in Burundi, a woman cannot inherit. Yeah. How was that? In, was in that many, there are places where it's not, that it's, it's way not, around yeah, around. But not often. There, yeah. There's exceptions for sure. Like in the Kikuyu community in Kenya, at a moment in history, the lines were more matriarchal. Okay. So people would inherit it through their mother, yeah. but it was a moment in history. Yeah. But for the vast majority, it's patriarchal, right? So wow. it's through your father, if you will. Yeah, mother. I'm glad you're saying that because I think we do a disservice to the, to the, to the history, definitely, but also the lived reality of women now, when we say that, when we sort of simplify it and minimize it by saying if, if it's all white supremacy, it's all the Catholic Church. And I think we also give white supremacy more power than it yeah, actually well, has. Than it actually has, yeah, true. Yeah. Damn it! We have to go. <laughs> we run out of time. <laughs> but listen, so I feel like I think everybody can agree this we didn't even get anywhere yet, right? Like so you have to come. I, I think again. I, I think I, I think you I think will. you're not okay. I will. <laughs> Thank you so much for your patience with me. And thank you so much for having me. Do you me. have any lasting words for people here? I'm sorry for the time, but maybe you have some lasting, inspiring words for today or for... <laughs> My faces. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to tell them, like, give us your money, no. Oh, yeah, cash. I think I'm supposed to say that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, see? Oh, so God, I'm going to give you that money. I no, know. you really can. You can yeah. give. Um, so we get money from everywhere. We get money from folks who have, you know, a organizations, the Bill Gates of the world and stuff. But we also get money from folks, like 5 euro, 10 euro a month. It really makes a difference. And the money that individuals give us is so much, it, there's so much less money laundering I need to do. <laughs> no, really. For, <laughs> because oftentimes it comes with less strings attached to it. Yeah. So um, please, when you send money, do not put in the, in the, in the, what's it, what's it called? The description. The description. Do not start putting requirements there, okay? Just give them money. <laughs> like, honestly, folks know what they need to do. Like, we don't need to roll up there and tell them what they need to do. They always know what they need to they do. do. They just need the resources. See, that's that intersectionality right there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think the program is going to start somewhere else. I have no idea where you're supposed to go, actually. We're... we're which way do people have to go? Okay, you tell them. Okay, yes, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Lava. Thank you. Uh, everybody, um, we